This next video covers Renaissance Venice, so we'll be focusing in on an area in northern Italy, and this is just an aerial view of Venice to over to um, give the sense that clearly it's a city of canals. You've got the Grand Canal, which cuts through uh, Venice right here. This is where some of the main palazzos were. The main piazza of Venice is down here, where you find the Church of San Marco, um, where the Doge's Palace was located and still is located, um, but just to give you a sense of how it's a space really very much dominated by water. Uh, to orient again geographically, Venice is right up here, and we'll be emphasizing the fact that this is a city that had um, very important involvement in trade and mercantile activity, so moving between east and west. It was a key city between the area of the east and trade from the east, and then area of the west and also northern Europe too. Uh, so Venice was very important as this mercantile center and as this bridge between east and west. So thinking a little bit about these Byzantine influences in Venice um, and thinking about some of the, the mercantile activities that may have taken place there, I just wanted to note that um, Constantinople is located over here. In 1453, the uh, Ottoman Turks will come in and sack the city, and so this leads to a lot of Greeks leaving the city of Constantinople and heading over to Venice. So that leads to a new cultural influx and influence coming into Venice, um, the trade from the East again is an influence. Uh, the Fourth Crusade in 1204 also was an influence between East and West and um, Venice also possessed a number of Greek colonies. So for example they controlled the island of Crete down here. This was an important trading outpost and so it was significant for their wealth and trade to control these types of islands. Uh, just having a look at the kind of architecture one might see in Venice, we're seeing some nice gothic tracery here in a photograph, and then just comparing it to a drawing from one of the notebooks of Jacopo Bellini. Jacopo Bellini was really, he's considered one of the founders of the Venetian early Renaissance school. Um, his family members, Gentile Bellini, Giovanni Bellini, uh, usually considered to be his sons, although the family tree is a little sketchy. Uh, he is really considered to be one of the early contributors to the Renaissance style in Venice. So if we have a look at this page from one of his artist notebooks, we can see that he's working on one point perspective. He's creating a very dramatic perspective scheme with the vanishing point coming right about here. Um, but you can see the type of archways and loggias were actually quite typical for Venice at that time. He's adding some classical style relief sculpture to the structures as well. Um, the balconies are quite typical for Venice. Uh, so just to compare that to an actual scene from Venice over here. And those elaborate window cuttings where you can see kind of the trefoil and quatrefoil frames were quite common in Venice. So what we're seeing here is the beginning of what we would consider um, kind of a hybrid type image that was very, very common in Venice. So this combination of Gothic tracery and then more Renaissance style. Um, and the scene here is the flagellation. So that would be uh, the beating of Christ. He's attached to a column here before the crucifixion. But really what Jacopo Bellini is doing here in about 1450 is working on his perspective scheme. Uh, of course it is a Christian subject, um, but it really is relegated to, you know, although it's the center of the composition, it's very, very difficult to see. So just something to keep in mind. Um, this is probably more for his own experimentation in perspective. Um, these books were, however, given as gifts. These were um, impressive objects once they were completed. And the drawings are highly finished. These aren't initial sketches. Um, so ideas of hybridity are important to keep in mind, especially in Venice, combining all the different traditions in this mercantile city. So this idea of hybridity uh, derives from primarily Latin American studies, but can be applied to other cultures, and it argues that cultures are inherently hybrid or mixed, and that they are not self-contained, and the product of intermixing and exchange, and Venice is definitely a great case study for this. Uh, another example by Jacopo Bellini is The Virgin and Child, a work of art that's in the Los Angeles County Museum uh, coming from 1465 approximately, and it demonstrates some nice mixing between East and West because you actually have Greek lettering, traditional for Byzantine icons, so icons were objects, um, spiritual, religious objects that were important for prayer and devotion, um, very holy objects, and so you can see some of the traditional Greek lettering that one would often see on an icon um, 
but also you can see there is Latin lettering. So you have a nice combination of Greek and Latin. Latin is traditionally Western. Greek is, of course, more East Euro Eastern European. Um, so you see the two blending in this nice hybrid example. Um, the style itself is very Renaissance. In fact, Jacopo seems to be quoting a sculpture by Donatello, a relief sculpture that um, shows some nice drapery, nice affection between mother and child. Um, these individuals seem very Westernized in the idea Italian way they preferred blonde hair at this time so it does seem that the style of the Madonna and child has become very Renaissance Western with this you know substantial body fleshy type of child um, rather than the flattened style we tend to see in the Byzantine period but the root of this really is the Byzantine icon the tradition of representing the Madonna and child um, so Theotokos means the bearer of God and that's what uh, the Virgin was declared to be, and then she's the mother of God, so reinforcing the idea of the mother of God. And then the Latin begins the um, Hail Mary prayer. So just comparing it to a Byzantine icon that did exist, or part of a Byzantine style um, altarpiece that existed in Venice, and so you can see that exact same lettering over here. So it clues in the viewer that they know this is a holy object and that they know that this is the Virgin because those would be the Greek letters that would tip you off. Um, so icons were important media for spiritual exchange in the 6th century. They were popular in the Byzantine Empire and this popularity continued. So there you can just see the comparison um, between the Jacopo and the Donatello. So you can see that strong similarity and even the Latin inscription is similar right here. Um, next, just pointing out Giovanni Bellini, Giovanni Bellini, uh, probably the son of Jacopo. Um, we talked a little bit about his versions of the Madonna and Child, and here we can see um, an example where it seems a little bit more creative in how the child and mother are represented. And this has sometimes been uh, analyzed psychoanalytically, thinking about Giovanni Bellini's relationship to his own mother or his own family situation. Um, why is the child maybe being more aggressive here, or why does the mother look kind of annoyed? Um, but most likely, Giovanni Bellini here is trying to go for a more playful, more affectionate style. Um, we can't say 100%, but it does seem that there was a strong demand for this type of image, this type of look for a painting, and so that seems to be developing. Bellini's giving people a lot of different options, or Giovanni Bellini and his father, um, Jacopo Bellini, are giving people a lot of options. So in the Cristeva article that we read, um, it's dealing more with some of the psychoanalytic and semiotic possibilities for this image, um, but most likely he's just trying to give the viewer more variety. All right, we're going to progress into the unified altarpiece and also the introduction of oil paint into Venice. Um, so we see the altarpiece going from that multi-part polyptic to a more unified sacra conversazione or sacred conversation. And we see this transition quite strongly in Venice. So um, one of the earlier examples, the earliest example was probably an example by Giovanni Bellini, but unfortunately it was um, destroyed in a fire. Um, but there is an individual named Antonella da Messina. Messina is a city in Sicily, so this means he came from the south, but he seems to have received training in the Flemish technique of oil painting and then brought it to Venice or been a key player in bringing it to Venice. And so what we see here is some of the rich detail, the luminous quality um, that's going to be associated with the Venetian Renaissance school. Um, the Venetian Renaissance school will be known as a, as a uh, area where color is very much valued, where paint is really applied straight to the panel and um, not a lot of underdrawing. So what we tend to see in Florence is an emphasis on drawing and design, and in Venice we see an emphasis on color. So just an important thing to keep in mind. Um, unfortunately, the San Cassiano altarpiece, which we have a sacred conversation, so a virgin and child with saints or angels and saints, um, is very much fragmented. It's been cut up into pieces, um, but it shows us this traditional idea of representing the virgin and child, similar to those icon images or icon-like images we just saw, um, but on a grander scale that could be included on an altar, on a large church altar. Um, so here we see saints that were likely uh, particularly sacred to the church in which this was located. 
And there were actually additional figures as well um, that have been cut out. And you can see a nice um, foreshortened arm here with the Virgin extending out to the viewer, the Christ child seemingly offering a kind gesture of blessing. Um, so the idea is that you're receiving some kind of interaction from the holy figures in the image going out to the viewer. And you have some nice details allowed by the oil paint that uh, Antonella Damasina is exploiting. So these, um, the, like the shimmer of these balls here, also the water glass representing here, the detail on uh, the brocade of the Virgin's garment. So all those things are significant to keep in mind because what we see is that Giovanni Bellini, um, one of the painters that we saw earlier when we were looking at the Madonna and Child images alone, um, Giovanni Bellini begins to learn from Antonello da Messina how to take advantage of some of those oil techniques, how to take advantage of the luminous quality that oil paint provides. So what we see here is called the San Giove altarpiece. It was probably commissioned in result of um, an epidemic of plague that had come into Venice because we do see some significant plague saints here. Uh, so we have Saint Sebastian here. We see the arrows going into his body. He was said to receive the arrows of the plague on behalf of the people, say protect people from the plague. Also um, Saint Job, so for whom it's named. Um, so Job obviously went through a number of trials and tribulations. He's an Old Testament figure. He went through these trials and tribulations as a way of testing his faith. So clearly a plague is a way of testing one's faith. So San, um, Saint Job would be a nice person to think of. You also have uh, Saint Francis and other holy figures, again in the Sacra Conversazione or Sacred Conversation, that is the Virgin and Child with angels and saints, inserted into um, a nice hybrid environment where you have the mosaics typical of Byzantine style churches, which there the main church in Venice, San Marco, has this kind of gold mosaic, um, but then also these kind of classicizing elements that indicate we're entering into more of a Renaissance period. Um, as I show you a close-up here from this altarpiece, hopefully you can see the luminous quality that is associated with the Venetian style of painting um, that Antonello helped to introduce into Venice with this new luminous oil style paint that will really dominate the 16th century as we move into the 1500s.